looks at us. He does not see our degrees. He does not see our bank accounts. He does not see our cars. He doesn't see the esteem that we are given by communities. Because the whole world is his. Amen. He owns everything and everyone who is in the world. But when he looks at us, there, there's one particular thing that he looks for. And if he can't find it, he builds into us. Let's read the Bible and get the foundation to this. The book says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Mm. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 26 simply says, And you shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy. And have severed you from other people that you should be mine. Two things are repeated. Holiness and being separate. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 13 simply says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto how many men? All men. Teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly. Where? In the present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 15 says, But as he which has called you is holy, ye also be holy. God has given us as a body of believers, and particularly as individuals, an identity God has called us as individuals and as families and as members of families to be holy I could sit down now because that's your identity you are not an Adventist you are not a Christian you are holy you are not a pastor you are not an elder. You are not a brother. You are not a sister. You are not a deacon or a deaconess. You are a holy vessel of God. You see, everything that's associated with God has to be holy. Otherwise, if it is not holy, it is not fit for God. See, when God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, he said, Abraham, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be holy. When God called Moses to lead his children, if you read Exodus chapter 3 verse 5, as Moses was facing God and the bush was burning, God said to Moses, draw not near to me, but put off your shoes from off your feet because the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moses had traversed those mountains of the Midian country looking after Jethro's sheep. He had passed by that bush but on that day simply because God was there that ground was holy. You see when he asked the children of Israel to build the tabernacle and all its furnishings God declared in Exodus chapter 25 right through to Exodus chapter 43 that every single item in that 
in that temple was holy. And all the people who had to go inside and touch those things had to sanctify themselves before they go in. When he chose people to work in his temple and he chose the priesthood of the house of Aaron, God said they must sanctify themselves and even the garments they put on. The Bible said they were holy garments. Telling me there are also other garments that are not holy before the Lord. When he called the Nazarites, he consecrated them to his service, gave them a lifestyle of what they will eat, how they will drink, and how they will look like because God expected holiness in them. You see, when God even made the Sabbath day and he demarcated the hours, he said, this is my time. God said, this is my me time, but I don't want to spend it alone. I want to spend it with you. You see, when he emancipated the Israelites out of Egypt, he said, you have seen what I've done to the Egyptians. That's Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 to 6. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, hello somebody, I have, I have taken you out of the darkness into myself, out of darkness into my light. Now, therefore, verse 5, if you obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A holy God needed a holy nation with a holy way of eating and a holy way of drinking and a holy way of dressing and a holy way of relating and he wanted them to worship him in a holy way because he created a holy worship system amen in order to create the character of holiness in their minds. Let me declare plainly and boldly before you that without holiness, none of us are going to see God. Because Jesus declared expressly in Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, for without holiness, without being pure in heart, we can't see God. Paul understood this message. And he said, once you are born again in Christ, you become a new creature. And he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, no thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, he says, And such were some of you, but you were washed by the sanctif and, and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let me say that the character of God is not that he's a God of love. That's a description of a trait of God. Because the Bible says, for God loved. So love, as God is concerned, is an attribute of who he is. But his real character is holiness. When Ezekiel saw the wheels that fly and the cherubims, on the throne room of God, what do they shout say? Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. He is holy. The high priest had to have a head that's written holiness unto the Lord. And therefore I would like to submit to you tonight that 
when God created us and when God covered us, he wanted us to be holy. My worry therefore tonight as we wrap up this day is that the church has changed the standard of our identity. Families have changed the standard of righteousness in the home as if holiness is only required on the Sabbath when we go to church. Holiness is not about retaining a faithful tithe. That's a fruit of a heart that's filled with God. My worry tonight and my burden for tonight is that for the sake of the greater good and being inclusive, we have lowered the standards. And we are worried that if we maintain a high moral standard of holiness, people are going to leave the church. In fact, I've seen throughout the history of the world that God never needed the numbers. He only needed those who were faithful. Those who are holy, those who aspired to be like God. You see, my worry is that the church has made love the umbrella term that identifies Christianity. Christians are people of love. We love each other so much that we hug. And we even kiss, like my sister said. Fair enough. That's all all right. But it doesn't mean that we are holy when we hug each other. Because holiness is having the character of God in us. Here is my warning to the church tonight. You see, there are things that you can do under the banner of love that you cannot do under the banner of holiness. It is possible to be a loving liar. A pathological liar, but be a loving person. But you can never be a holy liar. It is very possible to be a loving adulterer. You show all the acts of kindness. You are an angel in the home, but actually being an adulterer. Whether on your cell phone, on the internet, or in real life, having a small house somewhere. But coming home faithfully, sleeping at home every night. But it is not possible to be a holy adulterer. It is not possible to be, to be holy when you are cheating. But it is possible to be loving even though you are cheating. It is very possible to be a loving gay and lesbian. I have no problem with my brothers who live that lifestyle. But it is not possible to be a holy gay. Because the lifestyle is in contrast to the word of God. It is possible to be a loving thief. You got to steal to sustain your family. You get involved into deals that you know are shady. But to be loving, to be a good person, but actually it is not possible to be a holy thief. You can be a loving idolater, but you can't be a holy idolater. And therefore, yes, there is a difference between love and holiness. And what God expects from us is not just to be loving in the homes, but actually to be holy. Don't excuse love for being holy. Being holy is being like God, which means you stand for that which is right and you do not recant on the standard of God. You raise it up, even if it means it hurts you. We are a nation of priesthoods. God expects us to show the same attributes unto others. We were established by God to the end that we must be unblameable in holiness before God. It is not how well we sing. It is not how well we dress. But it is how well we are connected with God. It is not how high or how loud our amens are. Or our hallelujahs. 
It is not even the size or the grandeur of our churches that shows holiness. It is not even how big your piano is in the church or how well you play it. It's not about the color of your skin. It is not about how, where you live and where you work. But it is whether you have holiness in your heart. It is possible to know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and still not be holy. We must have a close and intimate connection with heaven. There's no way you can go to sleep at night without checking your emails. There's no way you can go and sleep tonight without checking your Facebook. There's no way you're going to sleep tonight without checking your Twitter account. But the question is, why is it normal for you to go and sleep without praying to a God you're supposed to be intimate with? How is it that we let things roll without spending time with God? I know we are busy people. I know we've got money to make. I know we've got bills to pay. We've got reports to write. We've got financial statements to review. We've got some labor to do here and there. But if we cannot invest time in knowing God and who he is and spending time in the gardens of our experiences to hear him talk and to understand what his voice is, we are in danger of losing out on heaven.